Good evening and welcome to the second in our three-part Friends Forum series on amplifying black narratives, black publishers and bookstores. I'm Lisa German, University Librarian and Dean of Libraries for the University of Minnesota. I'm sorry that I'm not able to attend our event this evening, but I look forward to catching up by watching the recording later. The University Libraries is a proud partner with our Friends of the University Libraries in presenting the Friends Forum, a series for curious minds. The Friends Forum showcases experts speaking about topics relevant to our community. For the libraries, the exchange of ideas during events like this one is so important to developing connections within our communities, and I'm delighted that each of you is attending. The University Libraries has 12 locations in the Twin Cities that attract more than 1.6 million visitors annually to access our books, electronic holdings, archives, and special collections. At the libraries, we're striving to improve the inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility of our collections. Our goal is to support not only our University of Minnesota community, but also our wider community with meaningful resources. Through our Givens collection of African American literature and our support of Umbra Search African American History, the University Libraries places special emphasis on the value of black narratives. While these may be laudable efforts, they're not enough. We also continue to strive for better representation in all our collections of narratives from all communities. I look forward to learning more from our panelists today about the work ahead of us all. Before we begin, I'd like to share a perspective that is relevant and important to all of us. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. Thank you. And now we will hear from Kate McCready, the library's interim associate university librarian for collections and content strategy, the moderator for this evening. And thank you very much to the Friends of the University Libraries for co-sponsoring this program. Thank you to Dean German and good evening, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. Thank you for coming to tonight's University of Minnesota Libraries Friends Forum event, which is the second in a three-part series focused on amplifying Black narratives. As Lisa said, I'm Kate McCready, the Interim Associate University Librarian for Collections and Content Strategy at the University of Minnesota Libraries. It's great to be here as moderator and a privilege to be in conversation with our passionate and talented panelists, Melina Mangal, Riquette CSR, and Dion Sims. After a brief introduction, we'll have an opportunity to hear a little bit about the work of our speakers to learn um, about their experiences in and reflections on the work being done by authors, librarians, publishers, and bookstore owners to create greater possibilities and awareness of Black voices. I've prepared several questions that I hope will spark a rich dialogue among them. This event is being professionally captioned. Please click on the CC button to view captions. And, and also, please use the chat button if you have technical questions. Um, there's also a Q&A button if you have questions for our panelists. You can submit those questions at any time, and we will get to as many as possible after the discussion. It is now my honor to introduce our panelists. Uh, Melina Mangal is an author and school librarian in Minneapolis. Working at the intersection of nature, literature, and culture, Melina's writing highlights youth whose voices are rarely heard, and the people and places that inspire them to explore their world. Her short stories appear in Milkweed Stories from Where We Live series, as well as in anthologies such as All the Songs We Sing, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Carolina African American Writers Collective. Mungal also wrote The Vast Wonder of the World, biologist Ernest Everett Just, 
which won the Carter G. Woodson Book Award and was named an NCSS CBC Notable Social Studies Trade Book. Mungo also works as a school librarian in Minnesota and enjoys spending time outdoors with her family, whether it's in her backyard or hiking in the woods. Her newest book is Jaden's Impossible Garden. Burkett CSR is an artist, author, and executive director of In Blank Inc., a nonprofit that seeks to create space where the intergenerational stories about Minnesota's uh, of African heritage can be shared, documented, and archived. She is also a school psychologist in Minneapolis Public Schools. She is a lifelong learner. She earned her Associate of Arts degree in illustration, fashion design, um, a bachelor's degree in child psychology and communications, a master's from the Institute of Child Development, and her educational specialist degree from the University of Minnesota's school psychology program. She attended the International Kefren Institute in Minneapolis, where she studied African foundations for community development. CSR co-founded and coordinated the Imhotep Science Academy and Initiatives, an African-centered K-8 educational STEM program, and also co-founded and served as the operations manager and in-house artist at Papyrus, Publish Papyrus Publishing. Dion Sims, our third panelist, is the founder of Black Garnet Books, a queer, Black, woman-owned bookstore. She received her bachelor's in communications from the University of Minnesota before building a career as a user experience designer. She created Black Garnet during the summer of 2020 as a response to state violence against Black people, as well as the purposeful exclusion of people of color from the literature community. We are grateful to have you here with us tonight. Um, each of our panelists are going to spend a few minutes sharing their story about how they came to work to came to the work they're doing and introduce some of the key issues that they have seen in their work. And now I'm going to turn this over to Melina Mangal. Thank you, Kate. And thank you to Lisa German and the Friends of the Library for hosting this event. And I'm really excited to be here. Um, celebrating sharing information with Raquette and Dion as well. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit of my personal story and how I came to be in the book world. Um, my life in book books includes a stint working in a bookstore, working as a textbook production editor, becoming a librarian and an author. My life revolves around books. Um, my writing began with letters to my father in Vietnam, my grandmother and cousins in France, my pen pal in Jamaica. Writing was the only way to communicate. We moved around a lot. International phone calls were very expensive. And of course, the internet wasn't yet a thing when I was a kid. Um, when my family moved to St. Paul from small town, Wisconsin, after fifth grade, my literary world expanded significantly. I participated in the summer reading program at the Lexington Branch Library in St. Paul. And I discovered autobiographies by people like Josephine Baker, Langston Hughes, artists with a connection to France, like me, artists who looked like me. Seeing their books prominently displayed made me acutely aware of what I'd been missing before that, books by and about other Black people. That's when the idea of becoming a writer first occurred to me. I began chronicling my feelings in a journal and wrote poetry like many young people did. Um, I didn't know any real writers though, but I knew I had to become self-sufficient. So my path through college focused on business administration, which landed me my first job coincidentally in publishing. My jobs, the textbook production editor opened up the world of book production. I learned how books are made from acquisitions through editing to the bound book. The entire manufacturing process was fascinating. I loved helping create a tangible product that you could hold and read. I also saw how important illustrations and photo selection are. I worked hard to find illustrators and select photos that represented a wide range of people, like the college students who would eventually buy the textbooks. I remember how appalled I was to see the outdated and stereotypical photo selections for a book that a colleague should have handled more diligently. It really struck me then how significant images are and how powerful books can be in reinforcing stereotypes or enlightening readers. I also realized how important intentionality is to be really focused on what you're doing 
and to understand the impact that your work can have on others who might have to read your book, as in the case of textbooks. It's also the time when I began frequenting Uhuru Books in Minneapolis, a Black-owned bookstore. It was eye-opening to see so many books by and about Black people on such a range of topics. It was an affirming place, helping to counter the negative attitudes and images around us. Though I'd been writing throughout this time, I began taking classes at the loft and through community ed, and I submitted my writing to contests and journals, but got nowhere. Um, I did get my first acceptance letter just as I was preparing to leave Minnesota and to leave publishing. Um, moving to the South and becoming a librarian brought me into another sphere of the book world. In graduate school, I was introduced to amazing authors like Mildred Taylor and Virginia Hamilton. I was blown away. As a kid, I didn't see many brown characters like me reflected in books, but here I was finding characters that not only looked like me, but they shared my interests in cultural identity, history, folklore, and the environment. Where were your books when I was young? I wondered. If they'd been available in my school's libraries, they weren't displayed or discussed. I was excited to learn about their books, but sad that I'd missed out on reading them when I was a kid. Part of the reason I became a librarian was because I don't remember having access to books like theirs when I was growing up. Then, as now, I saw the need for more librarians of color. Among librarians in the United States, roughly 83% are white, only 9.5% are black, according to the 2020 data. I knew that becoming a librarian was an important step in opening doors to young readers. I decided to become that person who enthusiastically curates and recommends books for all my students so that they can see themselves reflected in the pages of a book and travel to new worlds as well. I try to get them excited about reading and to find out what sparks their interests, whether it's reptiles after reading books like Dragons in a Bag by Zeta Elliott, or learning about leaders like Fannie Lou Hamer from authors like Carol Boston Weatherford. I got back to my writing at that time, joining the North Carolina Writers Network and becoming a member of the Carolina African American Writers Collective. Though my first publications were for adults, I refocused my efforts on children. I worked with young students all day and saw and noticed what was missing on the shelves, more stories and biographies about people who looked like them. I participated in the Chautauqua Writing for Children conference sponsored by Highlights and then focused on nonfiction. I write to connect to people, nature, history. I write to highlight our ancestors' lives, as well as the lives of my students and the child I was. As a librarian, I'm always looking for books my students might enjoy, no matter where they come from or how they are produced. Black bookstores, like the former Ancestry Books, new bookstores like Baby Cakes Bookstack, which is a mobile bookstore, the Strive Bookstore, which is inside the Sistas Co-op in the IDS Center, and Mind's Eye Comics, and of course, Dion's Black Garnet, uh, excuse me, Black, Black Garnet Books are, are all wonderful bookstores that curate books that center Black voices, voices that all our children need to hear. I'm always looking for more books through organizations like Strive, like Raquettes in Black Ink, and through events like Juneteenth, Rondo Days in Minnesota, Black Authors Expo. I'm focusing on normalizing our stories in the work I do and in the lists and collections I curate. We're not just diverse voices. We are people with family stories, adventure stories, fantasy and historical stories that should be acknowledged and shared with similar theme stories in libraries, bookstores, and in media. My book life is coming full circle as I participate in a storytelling cohort called Amplify Black Stories through the Brown Bookshelf, and again, through Highlights Magazine. Through this cohort, I'm making valuable connections around the country, helping to expand and deepen the connections between children's authors, educational and community organizations, publishers, and bookstores. I see my role right now as connecting the dots with the focus on young readers and their families, linking them to words and stories, ideas and resources, and new possibilities. My twin missions of writing stories and highlighting the stories of others has never felt more important. So now uh, for Raquette CSR. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure how I can follow that, Melina. <laughs> but um, a little about a little about my process. Actually, my process has been a little more like a um, not a scavenger hunt, but a little more spread out where I'm not going in one line. I didn't, I've always loved writing. Um, I was born and raised up until an early age in Guyana, which is in South America. Uh, growing up there and then coming here in about the third grade, one of the things that I noticed was um, just the, the power of writing in terms of the students didn't do like I came knowing how to write in cursive and knowing how to um, do a lot of things related to just capturing my own thoughts. And I found like that first year here, the language, even though English was my original language, was a little difficult. So what I did was I did a lot of listening and I did a lot of looking. And so in coming to know my surroundings and being the type of child that was always around the elders and was always around um, folks in um, just primarily the older folks. I loved listening to their stories. I loved um, kind of like imagination time where you got a chance to kind of just really go within and really search your mind's eye. So I was the type of person who lived like adventures without really talking about it. And so um, as I got to, well, early uh, middle school, high school, I did um, go to specialized art school because my father being a carver and a visual artist uh, found that that was once one of the things that I really, really was passionate about. So when we're talking about different arts, um, literary was one thing that I loved in terms of reading and then writing primarily. I know Melina mentioned uh, the diaries or you know just writing about your feelings. I remember I always had that little diary with a little lock and key, um, always kept a journal. And a lot of times I have not really opened it to share it with the world until I got to be a little older. I think it was um, actually when I was in, um, I decided to go back to school and obtain a bachelor's in psychology. And in doing that, I started tutoring right into second language students because it was just an area where I felt I felt comfortable, even though I never felt like writing was something that um, elevated me because it was someone else always kind of critiqued it. So it was, there was a love-hate relationship in a sense. But um, when, I, when I started to enter into that stage of um, really working with other people to fine tune and really look at their writing. I started also noticing that a lot of the young black people, young black boys and girls around me were often not encouraged to write. Um, a lot of times we hear, you know, we have an oral tradition. Um, our people are storytellers, but then I was learning a lot going into these different venues where we had written like tons of books, um, not just going back to, you know, our early greats um, in terms of, you know, the people that people usually um, reference like Toni Morrison and James Baldwin and even Langston Hughes and all of them, but going well back into um, the beginning of uh, early civilization. We've always had libraries when we talk about, you know, Timbuktu and other places across the globe that has held our thoughts and our ideas. And so I was interested in why it was that we were accepting that we are just a oral tradition group of people. And really, um, it hit me in terms of what the there, the drum, there's some trauma around writing. It's always been for me and I see other people as well because we're often encouraged not to document our own experience. And instead we're encouraged to share it with someone else who's documenting it. And so in 
get into the place where we started in Black Ink, um, my husband and I, who were both educators, um, both in kind of like educationally related fields, um, coming out of graduate school had decided that, you know what, we needed to create a curriculum because we didn't like the curriculum that existed for our would-be children to come. And so, and the children that we taught, you know, nieces, nephews. And so we decided to start what we called Papyrus Publishing, which was a publishing agency um, that we found uh, was community held. Several of our close community friends and family members, we encouraged to kind of do the graphics. We did the, you know, research together. We did the um, editing and, it sprung off from there where people actually started coming to us to help them publish their own works, primarily a lot of elders um, who really wanted to capture their life stories or write their memoirs, uh, started asking for assistance in doing that. Um, in I, I would say it didn't come full circle until my husband's grandmother passed and in passing, she left tons of stuff. And when I saw the family's response to the stuff as this stuff was junk and nobody wanted any part of it because it was just a lot of stuff to go through. She had China, silver, I mean, like multiple, like seven plus teapots with tea sets and just lots of really beautiful things that in any other um, culture would be considered an estate or, um, wealth where you can pass it on to family. But I saw that people were not connected to that because they didn't know the stories behind it. And it, again, we started uh, working with an elder in the community to help publish his work where he passed, he transitioned during the time he was being interviewed and the information was being gathered. And so with his transition in, we found that, you know what? There's so many stories that exist in our community and so many people that have lived these lives where they have had these, um, not adventures, but have these really deeply moving um, experiences. And we don't share it because a lot of times we're not writing it down and we're not passing on the stories just like we're not passing on the items that we own to our family as a part of the wealth that they are supposed to carry forward so we can build that generational wealth. So um, that's kind of how Black in Black Ink started to manifest. And then when this elder passed away, we we're really close friends with a few people in the community who encouraged us to really look at putting together something that would not just focus in on this group of people that we were interested in working with, but the state of Minnesota. And so that's how we um, manifest and moved into that particular um, role. And I jumped right in and I know Kate, I introduced us, but currently I'm the executive director for In Black Inc. And I know as we go along, we'll talk a little more about what the organization is and what we do. Um, but bottom line, we, we seek to really create spaces for people to understand the worth, the value of their stories, to be able to own their own stories, share it, document it, archive it, um, however they see fit, so that it's able to be woven into the tapestry of our state's stories. And with that, I'll pass it on to Dion. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for having me. I'm Dion Sims, uh, the founder and owner of Black Garnet Books. Um, I'll keep my introduction really short because um, there's, <laughs> I've uh, only been a bookseller for about a little over a year now. Um, so I'm really coming into bookselling and publishing uh, with really fresh eyes. Um, and also just really, just a really green uh, kind of outlook. Um, as was said, I started Black Garnet Books in the summer of 2020 as a response to um, the uprising that was happening here and 
in general, the focus on Black stories, Black storytelling, um, Black community spaces, uh, and, um, you know, just thinking about, for myself, the kind of things that I wanted to see more of in community, especially as I uh, took time away from um, the job that I had in tech in order to be in community. Uh, I really saw um, a gap that I believe that could be filled by, you know, a really um, hands-on space that would uh, put Black people in the forefront, uh, really took into account the things that they're looking for, that, um, you know, we're interested in. And um, yeah, I just really wanted to be uh, a part of building that here in the Twin Cities. So uh, that is something that I'm just so grateful to be able to do and so grateful to uh, every day be learning from uh, people like Raquette and Melina, who, um, Melina, who've been, you know, doing this for longer than I have and have so much more wisdom to share. And I'm just like so grateful every single day that I get to uh, be in this work and to be doing this with all of you. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, I will give it back to Kate. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to all three of you for sharing your stories uh, and sharing with us how you began your work. Um, I was really struck by how you talked about centering Black voices and the power of seeing people and characters that look like you as you were growing up um, and as you became professionals and being able to extend that expertise and that wisdom to uh, other young people. Um, I also was really struck by the importance of um, encouraging young Black authors to start writing, Raquette, uh, and documenting, having Black elders document their stories as well, uh, and just the possibilities that are created by raising up these books by and about Black authors that all of you are doing um, really expands and deepens connections between authors and readers. I um, I was glad you brought up some statistics as well, um, Melina, because I also um, pulled up some numbers as I was preparing for tonight. And I was struck by, you know, that the, the lack of representation by black authors is fundamentally a structural problem um, that requires intentional effort to address. Um, and obviously this comes from, uh, stems from historical injustices that, but it's persisted into our lifetimes. And just putting things into context, um, according to the American Association of Publishers, the total book publishing industry uh, earns about almost 26 billion uh, in annual revenue a year and sees over 1.8 billion books published a year. Um, and with a thank you to my colleague, Carolyn Lilliard, who found this report, um, there's a report called Lee and Lowe Books Diversity Suri Survey, and I can throw that into the chat in a minute. Um, in 2019, they received almost 8,000 responses to their survey. They sent it to a wide variety of publishers and booksellers. Mm -hmm. um, and they got uh, almost 20, they sent out almost 22,000 surveys deployed and they, sent it to reviewers, trade publishing employees, university press employees, literary agents, um, sent to both children's and adult divisions. And they found that 76% of the publishing staff, review journal staff and literary agents are white as compared to uh, being 60% of the general population in the US. The executive level saw 78%. And editorial um, was even more white and increased from 82% in 25, 2015 to 85% in 2019. So there's definitely work to do. Um, and you know, with, with that framework and within the context of your work today, I wanna pose some questions to, um, to you all and, and start the conversation. So within that context of your work within today's publishing landscape, I'm wondering, um, now that you've established yourselves in this work, what are some specific outcomes you're hoping to achieve in the next year or two? I'm just gonna jump in if that's okay. Um, the stats that you uh, provided actually, that was like one of the first um, 
comprehensive studies that have been done. I know they did a previous one in 2015, which is what we used when we were starting in Black Ink, um, because what we saw was that for 20 years before um, that, the publishing um, industry has been talking about, we need to diversify, we need to get more people of um, various um, cultural um, ethnicities and backgrounds in this industry. But yet a lot of the, um, a lot of the language around why they don't exist was that, you know, we we're just not ed editors, we're not writers, we're not all of these things. And so going back and tracing to like growing up, I think that whole anxiety around writing and having someone judge and edit your stuff, when you have lens of someone that's coming from a different cultural background, cultural experience, um, all of their um, references are different from yours, typically it's very difficult for them to edit you, <laughs> but that's what's done to a lot of our stuff. So part of our goal for the next couple of years um, is to really increase the number of publishing arts professionals that are in the field that are of African descent. And so that means not just authors, um, that means editors, desktop layout um, artists, um, proofreaders, uh, the, we say the marketing uh, folks, the people that actually decide where the work will be featured um, because all those different areas are areas that are lacking um, diverse voices. And so it's not just the person that's writing, but the person that's editing. So a couple, this past year during COVID, what we did was we started what we're calling an editor's apprenticeship. Um, and we're really trying to build into everything that we do, some type of apprentice type experience, because we are finding that part of the, the extreme lack of us being in this industry for such a long time means our experience is limited. And so when we do have the experience given to us, it's very difficult because we don't have the resources. And then sometimes we don't have um, the practical experience or guidance around that. And so we figure if we hire a professional editor, we pair them with um, learning you know, folks that are very interested in the field and are good writers, but would really like to be editors, then have them take a journey together and really learn what that trade looked like. And then actually have them edit and put in place some um, experiences for themselves so they are, they are marketable. So that's one of the areas that we've really been doing, looking at what types of practical classes and supports that we can have that will contribute to building the publishing arts industry. So editing apprenticeship, write an apprenticeship, any of those apprenticeships that will help is built in. And I'd like to add to that. Um, first of all, I echo what you were saying, Raquette, in terms of um, the voices that are getting published and looking at how we do need more agents and editors who recognize our stories. Um, I, I've had a lot of experience with that in, tr in trying to publish my stories for many years. Um, even though I grew up mostly here in Minnesota, I've had a range of comments from um, publishers here and elsewhere about how um, even for a Minnesota story that I've submitted that I didn't have the it lacked an elusive Minnesota quality, whatever that is. Some of the comments and kinds of things I've been told, even from editors who are not originally from here either. But um, there's still, a, 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 I won't say exactly stigma, but there is an attitude. There, there are um, the lenses that color our, some of our stories. And I do think that increasing um, representation in other parts of 
the um, publishing industry is super important. And in addition to your organization, Raquette, which um, is, is a wonderful pathway that you're providing. Um, I know there's other organizations too, like Wise Inc., which is also here in the Twin Cities, co-founded by an African-American uh, woman named Dara Beavis, and they have a Pathways to Publishing program um, that is also new, and they are trying to encourage more people of color to become editors and um, in get involved in the other facets of the publishing world. There's another problem with a lot of publishers as well in their internships and with agencies as well. A lot of times um, they will offer their internships all over the place, but many of them are unpaid. And I think only now I'm starting to see, and there's, there's a real emphasis on starting to provide internships that are paid. Um, for, that will increase the candidates that are available uh, and, and able to take uh, advantage of that or able to participate because that is a huge barrier for people to become involved in um, publishing when you need to take an unpaid internship, move to a different city um, like New York or some of the other big publishing um, areas to, um, to learn the trade. And so, um, for publishers to really look at that, at offering additional internships, paid internships, and to actively recruit is very important. Um, and I'm seeing more of that now, which is great, but I think there's still a really big need for that to widen the field for editorial agents and other parts of the publishing world. Yeah, and I would say just from um, a bookseller point of view, you know, um, it's it's increasingly um, well. It's it's difficult to really get people to understand just how um, <laughs> just how white publishing is, especially when you're ordering books, especially when you're trying to like when you're trying to fill your shelves with only books by people of color, which is something that my bookstore does. Um, and, you know, people come in and they're like, wow, this is an incredible selection. Like, how did you, how did, how did it come together? Like, who put this together for you? And it's like, I had to sit down and put this together. I, you know, I had to talk to other black and brown people, you know, it's a lot of right now grassroots networking, um, among black and brown people from the start of the, you know, editing experience with books to trying to uh, get published, to being published, to the, distribu the distribution of those books. All of it is a lot more, um, I would say, hand-to-hand -hand for Black and Brown people. It's a lot more of uh, us really having to do an extra layer of work on top of the work that is already necessary uh, to, you know, be in this industry in any sort of capacity. Um, you know, so I think another thing with getting more black and brown people into editing and publishing is just making it so that uh, we can take that extra layer of work off of, you know, the, the backs of these editors, or not editors, but authors, uh, the backs of booksellers who are trying to get diverse books on their shelves. Um, so that we can order books, we can fill our shelves, we can get published um, in the same manner that, you know, and with the same ease, not that publishing, not that getting published is easy, but it is going to be easier for someone who is white, for someone who is telling a story that a white editor is going to feel uh, a sort of attachment to or is going to see themselves in. Um, it really affects everything from the beginning to, you know, the end where I'm handing a book to a customer. So, yeah, just really want to echo the importance of everything that uh, Melina and Ka Riquette have said so far. Thank you. Um, the next question that I plan to ask, but I, I, I was about how you've outlined what the near term future looks like. Um, and what you see as barriers to accomplishing this, but you also, you all talked quite a bit about some of the barriers for some of the, the future things. Do you have anything you wanted to add about barriers that 
that you've seen. I know Melina, when we talked, you talked a little bit about the, the vendor um, within the schools. Um, that was one thing that came to mind, but if there's others that you'd like to mention um, as well, I think that would be great to highlight some of those barriers so we can be thinking about how we can overcome them. That's a huge one, which is of course, um, buying books from smaller uh, producers, smaller publishers, independent publishers, um, African-American publishers. Um, in our area right here, we have some phenomenal new publishers like Strive Publishing. Um, and uh, it they're doing some great work producing some wonderful books. Um, and there are more who are coming. And then there are a lot of people, authors who uh, produce their books independently um, because uh, they don't want to have to wait for um, a traditional route that may or may not ever happen. And there are people who want to read their books. And so uh, I know, for example, in some of the schools, um, a lot of school districts are limited to a certain number of um, distributors or uh, larger uh, book um, jobbers that, that uh, we are able to use. And so um, as part of this and looking at how to make this process more equitable, it's really important for districts, for um, universities, for um, the book buyers to really look at how are we selecting our vendors? Are we looking at smaller local um, independent vendors as well that produce the, the, the voices and produce the stories of the people who live right here, of, of all the people nearby, of voices that we may not be hearing otherwise. Um, and really being intentional about making that happen. Um, that, that is a huge barrier because that's systemic and it involves you know, approval processes and um, vetting different vendors. And sometimes that can be very bureaucratic and can be a very lengthy process. But I, I think it's very important. And I don't think that you can say that you are doing all you can to be equitable or to elevate the voices of uh, Black people and other BIPOC people unless you are actually looking at other ways of um, making sure to include the purchasing of books from those vendors and those independent producers. Um, because again, we're looking at it through a different lens. This is a very um, Eurocentric view to look at it like it has to be one of these major publishers from New York or um, LA, one of the other book industries. We, we have producers everywhere right now and technology has allowed this. We are able to produce our own books more independently, more quickly um, without the need of this big structure. And so um, I think our districts, our school districts, our universities need to change and need to reflect that, that technology is allowing this. And, and it's really opened up the doors to many people, but those doors uh, are not opening widely enough to get those books to all the people that really should have access to them. So that, that's a huge factor. I would add, um, I think just the misconception that um, there's one black or one African culture um, and that people are not, um, that there's no diversity within each ethnic population. I think that's a huge barrier because what we find sometimes is people, um, if they do, want to order and enhance their library. They'll order one or two books from you, but then from everyone else, there might be, you know, 10 copies. And the idea is that only you and your family will want to read it and no one else would want to read it. And I think that misconception is global in terms of, you know, not just our state, but, you know, in terms of our um, country, because a lot of people feel like we write books to tell ourselves about ourselves and that they, you know, they think it's a nice ex exercise and a journey that you're going through, but you really aren't writing it to also sell it to others and enhance their learning. And that's one of the things when I see people, you know, they, they're very excited about us 
writing, but then the sales don't show, you know, that, that excitement is actually an interest. So I think just the understanding that these books are not just for, you know, that particular person and their family, but it's in almost a window into another world that coexists with you. It allows you to, you know, look and see, you know, what that person's life is like, what their experience has been like. And with that, I think the, the piece from the publishing um, and that has been really, really challenging is that most people who come to us um, don't come with a fully completed manuscripts. There's variation in terms of where they're at with their writing. Some, um, a lot of the, like I mentioned before, a lot of people that come, they, they're elders or they might be older and they have these stories, but they need a lot more support to kind of get it from, you know, their experience to an actual manuscript and then to an actual publication. So we're, we might be talking about, you know, transcribers, interviewers, you know, um, uh, just that whole process of helping them pull out some of that information because a lot of the experiences have been uh, relatively painful or traumatic, not that that's the only place we write from, but um, to even get to that place of joy, a lot of people go through that other place to, you know, manifest their stories. And so that's been a challenge because when we sit down with someone comes, often they come to us and they say, I really need to write this. And then we have to think about who can help them write that, that have a similar voice that can, that won't, you know, take on the project as if it's not their story and won't dismiss the nuances that actually make it their story. So that has been a challenge. Um, the finances is always challenging. I think, you know, um, I am not able to sell books to a large scale bookstore. Um, I think there's been some changes, but typically um, to get a, your book, say like into Barnes and Noble on the shelf, you have to have a certain amount that's been printed in order for them to order and make sure that all of their chains have it accessible to them. Otherwise, you know, you they will order it one or two at a time as people come in and request it and it's not stocked anywhere. And so it's very difficult to project any, um, you know, uh, profit lines or how, how much you're able to actually contribute to another project based on how much you're making from this project. So those are all areas that I feel are challenging for us. Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? I didn't. <laughs> okay, then I'll move, I'll, move, I'll move on to the next question then. Um, so you're you're all at the forefront of this, and um, and obviously you're doing really important work um, to raise up Black voices. But who else needs to step up? Um, because you know, as as I commented to you all before, you you all have really busy lives, and you are doing a lot. And um, and who else needs to step up? Because you can't you can't do it all yourself. What what are you? Who are you encouraging to step into this work? I can start with this one. Um, I think there is there is this kind of expectation, especially um, from um, white people to black people or people of color, that uh, the responsibility of um, you know of especially in the past year, anti-racism work, the responsibility of you know, anti-racist education, of uh, diversity and inclusion, all of those things uh, rests on black and brown people to do. Um, and I think for a lot of us, uh, Melina and Raquette, you probably can relate to this. Uh, a lot of the work that we do in those areas is passion work. It's because we feel called to it. It's because it's something that is 
important to us in our day to day. It's important to our families, the communities that we're a part of, our friends. Um, you know, it's work that is often thankless and but is also like intrinsically tied to the professional work that we do, um, you know, within publishing and bookselling. So it's hard when you're in the position of, um, you know, of feeling passionate about uh, education, feeling passionate about making sure that our stories are being told and being told fairly. Um, and you also have a full-time job <laughs> on top of it. And then you've got the full-time job of being a black or brown person uh, who is also an educator or uh, a creator of any sort. Um, to me, it is just so important for people to be mindful of that when they come to um, black and brown leaders in any space, but especially in publishing and request any type of uh, extra labor that is more than what we're already giving. Um, you know, for example, I put together these highly curated lists uh, by genre, by age group um, of books by black and brown authors for people to, you know, read and, uh, you know, purchase. Um, they're all up on Bookshop uh, specifically and also online on the website. Um, and so for me, it's very difficult when people, when uh, people feel an urge to uh, diversify their libraries or diversify, um, you know, their, their companies, uh, book club or anything like that. And they come in and they're like, I need a very, like, I specifically want to see like a list of these books, you know, what books should I read? And I'm like, I actually already put all of that together. Like all you have to do is click on this, but there's always a little bit of pushback of like, well, you know, those are the books that everyone else is reading. Like we really wanna see specifically books that are like this, this, or this. Um, it's a very, it's just, it's it's almost even hard to explain because it it feels, it feels sort of inconsequential when you explain it out loud, but when you have that many, the number of people who are usually like coming towards you with those kinds of requests, um, it just gets very out of control and it gets very, you start to feel like you're responsible for all of the work and education that is happening in these spaces. Um, and that simply like cannot be the case, <laughs> you know, um, so, I, I just I just really one thing that I like to tell people is, you know, um, just one really try and get black and brown people uh, on your teams in these spaces because, you know, you're not going to have to backtrack and move from a sense of urgency if you already have people who are like if you already have diverse spaces, like you're not going to feel this kind of like urgent push once a year when diversity is the hot topic among, you know, mainstream uh, thought and mainstream media. Um, if that's already something that is important to you and important to the organizations that you're a part of. And that takes a lot of the pressure off of, um, you know, leaders in these spaces to make up for however many months you weren't thinking about diversity and that you suddenly are. Um, so really just like a kind of a consistent intentionality about it, uh, I think takes a lot of, it takes a lot of pressure off of uh, people in, you know, our, our uh, spaces and in our shoes. So. I agree with Dion. Um, I also want to add, um, I really feel that I, and I know we use the term diverse and diversity, but it, you know, it, in my opinion, it's really about normalizing because this is our world. Our world is us, is all of us. We are part of it. Um, and I think it starts with everybody because I think this is work that everybody can and should do. Looking at where you fit into this American world, this American culture and history, your family, how did you get here and understanding where you fit into that and what uh, privilege you might have, what privilege you might have, but what can you do within your sphere of influence to change something, to do something different? Um, 
for me, because I work in a school library, it's really also about supporting school libraries, making sure there's a school librarian in your school to help curate and do the work of making those collections equitable and inclusive for everyone in the school. Um, it's also about um, recruiting and increasing the number of Black librarians, librarians of color across the board. Um, there's a really interesting article I came across recently by Sojourner Cunningham, Samantha Gust, and Jennifer Stout called Challenging the Good Fit Narrative. And it's a little, it's specifically towards um, university or academic libraries, but really applies across the board. And it's looking at, you know, what is it that our criteria, criteria what are we looking at? But they leave with a really interesting and important quote that I think sums it up for what everybody can do. Um, and it's about looking at how do we, we start and they say, more importantly, white librarians should educate themselves on racism, microaggressions, and bias, and work on fighting bias within themselves and standing up when they see it play out in their workplaces or in their personal lives. They should listen to librarians of color and validate their experiences. Everyone can work to challenge racism in their communities. But again, it starts with looking at your position, your biases, and what is it that you could do differently. Um, and I think that's something everyone can do and it should start now. I would wholeheartedly agree with um, Melina and Leon. Um, primarily the piece around whose responsibility or who do we need to bring to the table. Um, I definitely feel like it's everyone, we're coexisting in the space together. And what has become very deadly for us, not just, um, figuratively, but literally is um, ignorance and lack of knowledge. And if people are to um, really fight against some of the misconceptions, the misinformation, the misinterpretation, all of the misses that's happened over the years, I think there really needs to be um, a passionate drive to make sure that inclusivity isn't me letting you in, but us like having conversations about who each other is. Um, and quickly, um, my daughter, um, she's older now, but when she was in high school, she went to Central High um, High School in St. Paul. And one of the things uh, we were excited about when I sat in the orientation with her is they said that in this auditorium, in this building, there will be over 130 something languages. Um, people representing over 100 different countries. And so there was a listing of all these different um, groups of people. And my immediate thought was, oh my gosh, you go in knowing one language, you can come in, come out knowing at least two or three. Why not? But it's not when you walk through the halls of most schools, you have people parceled out in groups where although there might be over 130 something languages there, it's never, you know, crossing. They're not interacting in meaningful ways where one isn't pulling rank and influencing everyone to speak the same, you know, language or understand the same way or use the same perspectives. And so um, I really think that people from all walks of life are needed to be in this conversation and at the table. They need to be able to educate themselves and educate their families. Um, and just one last thing, I recently read an article, um, it was in the Washington Post called Excluding Black Americans from Our History Has Proved Deadly. And it's by a young lady um, um, who actually works with the Smithsonian around archiving. And part of what she said is that this whole concept of selecting out our remembrance, like what we choose to remember is really um, detrimental to our moving forward. Because we're, if I experience something and you never hear about it because it's been omitted, it becomes very dangerous for me to exist in a world where I'm the only one to remember my experience. 
and everybody else has been wiped from. So that's, I really do feel like that, that point is the strongest. We need everyone. We definitely need librarians like you, Kate, and at every level. And you, um, Melina, I mean, in the elementary, the middle, the secondary, all those different levels, because librarians serve a huge benefit to every community, but for a long time, libraries, like everything else, was segregated. And so that's a part of the remembering that we have to do when we look at why aren't children in the library, or why aren't they reading, or why aren't they um, coming to pick up books if there's only one section, so. Thank you, um, and thank you for appreciating librarians. Um, we, we like that. Uh, and I'm going to turn now to some of the questions from our audience members. Uh, and the first one has to do with librarians. Um, Amelia White wrote, given the lack of racial and ethnic diversity among librarians, what can libraries do to ensure they have collections that are reflective of the demographics of their community, their state, and the nation? I can start real quick. I think they need to train and that's this, that's not just, that's for every field. They're, the training programs are not inclusive. And the starting from the very beginning, like I mentioned in terms of writing, writing for me was very painful because you have people that was always using their red marker and crossing things out. I had a younger sister who came to me once with her paper all marked up saying that my teacher told me that my paper was atrocious. I don't even know what atrocious means. And it was, you know, it's traumatic when you have someone that's great in you and they're also tearing apart what you're, you know, and not really helping you learn the process because every writing class I was in, I was not considered a writer. And that's all the way through college. And I was deterred from writing a lot of times. And so I, I, I just feel strongly like that the training programs have to go in at every level so that we can actually train teachers to include other cultural voices, other ethnic experiences, just include so that it's not so linear and so um, singular. Thank you, Raquette. I, I totally agree with that. Um, I've also come across a really good curriculum for librarians that I uh, really want to recommend. It's something I introduced to our school librarians in the district, and um, it's based on individuals doing their own work, um, individuals really exploring their issues of race and bias and culture and where they fit into it and learning about our history from all perspectives. And um, I'm actually gonna put that in the chat. There's a really good curriculum out of University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, my alma mater. And um, it is free and it is um, something that librarians can start using. It's, it's geared a little bit more towards youth, serving youth in libraries, but it is beneficial and useful to all librarians and all educators. I, I honestly think everybody could benefit from using that curriculum. It's really accessible, easy to get to. But um, again, I, I really believe it starts with doing your own work and, and educating yourself and thinking about what is it? What, what are your biases? How do you um, connect with other people. Um, so I put that in the chat and hopefully that's a, a start. It's a, I think it's a really good curriculum. Thank you. And Melina, there's also a question very specific to you in the Q&A um, about repeating some of the local bookstores. And it looked like you were starting to type an answer. Are you putting those in that? Um, I can. Um, Unless you want to just mention them again. Yeah, I, I can mention them again. And I think I recognize that name, but um, Hello, Liz. But um, I, um, there's a couple, of course, there's Black Garnet Books with Dion right here. There's uh, Mind's Eye Comics, which is a comic book in Burnsville, which is a black owned comic book store. There's uh, another new one that's um, focused on children's books and younger children, which is um, Baby Cakes Book Stack. 
and that is a mobile bookstore. So it's like a bookmobile, but it's a bookstore that travels around. Um, and so that's another really cool one. And then Strive Publishing, which produces books um, and um, presents an annual writing contest for African-American children's book authors. Um, is community-based in North Minneapolis, and they have now a brand new store in the Sistas Co-op in the IDS Center in downtown Minneapolis. So um, it's so new, I haven't had a chance to check it out yet. I'm super excited to check it out, but that is another new bookstore. Um, there may be more, but those are some of the ones that I'm familiar with and um, really excited about. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna move to a question from Zavion. Um, who wrote, how do we navigate through the whiteness of the literary world? As in, how do we find the balance between using black slang, um, African-American vernacular English, or using black characters without using harmful stereotypes? Is there a sense of code switching in the literary world? That's a really good question. Um, and I think that's something that, um, a lot of us always grapple with. Um, I, I think first and foremost, it's really important to just tell your story as you feel it, as you hear it yourself to get that out. Um, as you work on it, I think those details get settled a little bit more easily. Cause I think first and foremost, you need to please yourself and, and listen to that voice that you have inside. Um, I, I still think it's a really big problem with editors that many do not understand the language or the perspective that you might be trying to take. Um, I had an agent who was a wonderful person out of New York City. Um, she worked on me with a young adult novel that I had and um, we kept changing it, kept changing it. I kept trying to modify and edit according to what she said would be marketable. And I ended up after a couple of years feeling like I'd lost my voice. So you really have to find the right editor or agent as well. And that takes time. But um, I think first and foremost is not to listen to any other voices but your own or the voice you have in your head if you're channeling an ancestor or someone else in your community and, and really stay true to that. I think that um, you will find someone, you will find an editor who will understand or um, relate to what you're trying to say. It may take a while, but you know, publishing in general takes a while. But I think... Um, stick with that voice. There are websites, there are people who talk about, um, you know, what, what might be more acceptable in terms of um, editors accepting language and, and the code switching um, aspects of it, um, which you can easily Google. But um, I think more than anything else, it's really sticking to what feels true to you. Yeah. I think it's actually, I totally agree. I think it's actually um, refreshing. I remember um, a interview with Alice Walker where she said she was asked, um, apparently when she wrote The Color Purple, she mentioned that nobody really wanted to publish it because um, of the dialect and the language that she used, the broken English and uh, the critique that she got, uh, even from, you know, our community was that it didn't paint us in a good light, but she needed that, those voices and that dialect to actually be able to tell the story. And in response to the person that was asking the question, she said she started her own publishing <laughs> company, which isn't advisable for everybody because it's a, it's a lot of work. But I think, um, like you said, Melina, just really listening to that voice that actually instructs you, that feels authentic for you, but then also um, understanding that you might have to do a little bit of your own research because we do have dialects that are different. Um, there's been a lot of struggle around Black English and um, Ebonics and just some of the teaching around that, but just really understanding the nature and the place where some of those um, mixtures of dialect came from and why it's been used and how, you know, like when you have groups of people come from different parts of the world or different parts of, you know, the continent, 
with different languages that how amazing it is that they came up with languages that they can all speak and understand regardless of the different intonations or the different areas where you hear um, something that doesn't sound like it's typical, you know, for your ears. But I would definitely say, you know, explore, do some, some of your own research and stay authentic in terms of your voice and seek someone who understands the dialect that you're trying to use or the, um, if it's slang, you need someone that understands it because sometimes it is too much and it doesn't really um, represent the uh, person or the character in the best way because of how it's used. And you need someone who can honestly understand it and then tell you that if that's the critique, but not just remove all of it and, you know, standard English only. Thank you. Um, Dion, there was a question directly to you uh, in the Q&A and it, are you answering that? Um, you, you typed in an answer there. Yes, the one about the um, process for local authors, yes. Yes, so you said that's a process still to be determined about how to see your, a book on your shelves. Um, yeah. And um, also related to another question about consignment that you're going to be sharing out a consignment process early next year um, as you prepare to open the, the brick and mortar location. Um, and that will be shared on your website. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Wonderful. So stay tuned on, um, on that, uh, uh, both the brick and mortar consignment and, and finding ways to be uh, an author that's on your shelves that you'll be adding more information to your website on that. Wonderful. Um, I think we have we have time for one more question. Um, we're not going to get to all the questions um, in the, the Q and A, so I apologize for that. But I'm I'm so grateful for such a robust conversation. But one more question, and and maybe two minutes that we have to answer it. Um, James Johnson uh, asked, um, "When would a good option to get published?" when you don't get a good look by or an agent or a publishing company, um, or they don't pay or they don't take on unsolicited manuscripts, what's, what's the best route to go? Would independent publishers be the route to go or would it be self-publishing? Um, and any advice that you have for someone, an author that's, that's trying to make their way into the publishing industry and, and get some, some attention? Um, I still think there's a, there's a lot of different routes. Um, my books have been published by um, smaller um, publishing companies, um, not some of the big New York Five. Um, and I've, I've been really happy with that because they're able to publish uh, and keep books in print longer. Um, I think publishing industry in general is very difficult to uh, because there is a lot of research involved if you don't have an agent. I don't have an agent, but I do a lot of research. I'm a librarian, but um, you really have to focus in on um, companies, publishers that produce the types of books that you like. Um, I think that's one way. And that's more of a traditional way, but we do have, and I, I see keep seeing Crown's picture at the bottom here for uh, the next panel, but like Crown Shepherd, there, there are a lot of people who are publishing independently too um, and raising funds through Kickstarter and organizations like that. So um, I think my personal preference and my route has been more to try some of the different publishers because there are so many. Um, and we have some great new ones, like I mentioned, Strive here. Um, and of course there's In Black Ink right here too. But um, I, I think spending the time to really think about and visualize what you want your book to be and who you want to read it, who do you want to reach can help you target um, who you spend time trying to um, submit your manuscript to. I think either way, whether you're trying to get an agent, an editor, or just you know, um, even trying to find your own um, publishing venue, it's all going to take time. It, it's all kind of lengthy, but um, I've been considering independently publishing or self-publishing some things as well. So what's really nice is that we have all these options, um, but I think first and foremost, think about what, what you really want to get out of it or who do you want to reach 
um, because that, that can help you determine which route you go. Um, and we have in the Twin Cities, there are some really good um, self-publishing options uh, through uh, like Wise Inc. and some other places that can really help you produce your book as well um, and, and help you get a quality book. Um, and Strive, Strive is a really good place to start as well. And congratulations on writing. I, there's a couple of other writers here like Cole Neese. So congratulations on your book. I just saw that, but it, it's wonderful to hear about so many other writers here who are getting their work out. Thank you. Um, and we are at time. So I, I hate to wrap up this conversation because it's been wonderful, but um, but we should we should probably honor people's evenings, even though it is cold and rainy. I hope everybody gets to cuddle up um, maybe with a good book. But um, thank you, so everyone, for this fantastic discussion. And thank you especially to Melina, Raquette, and Dion for being here and sharing about your important work. Um, it's really been my honor to facilitate this conversation and to meet you all. Um, and thank you to the audience for all your great questions. Um, I hope you can join us for the next Amplifying Black Narratives webinar that will be on November 18th. Um, at that session, we're gonna host a virtual panel on the creation of Black Narratives. So I think a lot of you who attended tonight um, might find that interesting, a lot of the folks that were asking questions. Uh, this evening's program, again, is sponsored by the Friends of the Libraries. If you are a friend of the libraries, uh, we are very grateful for your support. And if you are not yet a friend, please consider supporting our organization. Uh, you can find a link for the Friends um, on our library's news website, which is at continuum.umn.edu, um, c-o-n-t-i-n-u-u-m.umn.edu. So thank you um, all for joining us this evening. Stay warm and dry and have a good night. <laughs>